Good morning, my friends, and welcome to worship right here at Wyoming Baptist Church. I'm so glad you're here to worship with us on this first Sunday in the season of Lent. It was really great to see so many of you this past Wednesday when we celebrated Ash Wednesday and remember that we are dust and to dust we will return. But this doesn't have to be depressing because our dependence upon God is on a God who has promised to raise us up one day. And so it's that same dependence that we're going to be focusing on for this whole season of Lent as we think about what it means for us to repent, what it means for God to deliver us from our sin and to save us. So I encourage you to stick with it this season of Lent as we continue to remember God's love for us and our dependence upon him. To do that, I'd like us to open up this Sunday's worship with a prayer, praying together, a congregational prayer of response. You will find the words on your screen here in just a few moments. Um, your response will be bolded. I encourage you to follow along and pray this prayer with us. Let's pray this morning as we begin our time of worship today. Oh Jesus, meek and humble of heart, hear our prayer. From the desire of being esteemed, Deliver us from the desire of being loved. Deliver us from the desire of being extolled. Deliver us from the desire of being honored. Deliver us from the desire of being praised. Deliver us from the desire of being preferred to others. Deliver us from the desire of being consulted. Deliver us from the desire of being approved. Deliver us from the fear of being humiliated. Deliver us from the fear of being despised. Deliver us from the fear of suffering rebukes. Deliver us from the fear of being falsely accused. Deliver us. From the fear of being forgotten, deliver us. From the fear of being ridiculed, deliver us. From the fear of being wronged, deliver us. From the fear of being suspected, deliver us. That others may be loved more than us, Jesus. Grant us the grace to desire it. Amen. There is a name I love to hear, I love to sing its word. It sounds like music in sweetest name on earth. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus, because he first loved me. It tells me of our Savior's love, who died to set me free. It tells me of his precious blood, the sinner's perfect Jesus, oh, how I love Jesus, oh, how I love Jesus, because he first loved me. It tells of one whose loving heart can feel my deepest woe, who in each sorrow bears a part that none can never know. Oh, how I love Jesus, oh. This morning, Glenn Markle will be reading our scriptures for us, starting with a reading from Psalm 25, followed by a look at 1 Peter chapter 3, and then closing out with the story of Jesus' baptism and temptation in Mark chapter 1. 
So let's come now before the Lord our God, asking him to illuminate our hearts and our minds as we look at his word this morning. Holy God, we ask that you guide us today by your, by your word and your Holy Spirit, so that in your light we may see light, and in your truth we may find freedom, and in your will we may truly discover peace through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our psalm for today is from Psalms chapter 25, verses 1 to 10. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. O my God, in you I trust. Do not let me be put to shame. Do not let my enemies exalt over me. Do not let those who wait for you be put to shame. Let them be ashamed who are wantonly treacherous. Make me know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me. For you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all day long. Be mindful of your mercy, O Lord, and of your steadfast love, for they have been from old. Do not remember the sins of my youth or my transgressions. According to your steadfast love, remember me, for your goodness sake, O Lord. Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, he instructs sinners in the way. He leads the humble in what is right and teaches the humble his way. All the paths of the Lord are steadfast love and faithfulness for those who keep his covenant and his decrees. Our New Testament reading for today is from 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 18 to 22. For Christ also suffered for sins, once for all, righteous for the unrighteous, in order to bring you to God. He was put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit, in which also he went and made a proclamation to the spirits in prison, who in former times did not obey, when God waited patiently in the days of Noah during the building of the ark, in which a few that is, eight persons, were saved through water. And baptism, which this prefigured, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God, with angels, authorities, and powers made subject to him. Our gospel reading for today is from Mark chapter 1, verses 9 to 15. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the Spirit descending like a dove on him and a voice from heaven, You are my Son, the Beloved, with you I am well pleased. And the Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. He was in the wilderness forty days, tempted by Satan, and he was with the wild beast, and the angels waited on him. Now, after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God, and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. When Jesus came to Jordan to be baptized by John, he did not come for pardon, but as the sinless one, he came to share repentance with all who mourn their sins, to speak the vital sentence with which good news begins. He came to share temptation around 
most woe and loss, for the sad of salvation to die upon the cross. So when the dove descended on him, the Son of Man, the hidden years had ended, the age of grace began. Come, Holy Spirit, aid us to keep the vows we make. This very day invade us and every bondage break. Come, give our life's direction, the gift we covet most, to share the resurrection that leads to Pentecost. Good morning, everyone. This is Sunday, February 21st. These are the following prayers we'd like to offer up. First, like in Nancy's friend, Paulette Nixon, who is struggling with COVID-19 and who has just lost her husband from the effects of this COVID-19. Please keep them in your prayers and their families. For healing, we'd like to Prayers for Chad Price, who has also COVID-19 and is experiencing moderate symptoms. For Mike Hevesak, who will be having an MRI in February, hopes that his months of chemotherapy have significantly reduced his cancer. Bob Henschel, Pastor Jason's uncle, and his family, after being diagnosed with a quickly progressing form of dementia. For endurance, confusion, and comfort, strength in their struggle with cancer and other diseases, we pray for Karen Clary, who will soon be starting a trial cancer treatment after the ineffectiveness of her earlier chemotherapy. For Mindy Barnett, who is conflicted with cancer. And for Janice Meyer, who is also fighting emphysema. And finally, for our nation and our world, for everyone in Texas and across the nation who continue to suffer without heat or drinkable water, and for the lingering damages caused by these recent winter storms, for those in position of leadership at local, state, national, and international levels, that God would grant them wisdom and compassion in the midst of this pandemic and this climate change. Please, Lord, be with us all and help us to pray for them. Thank you. Amen. Thank you, Dennis. And now if you would all join me as we pray for these requests this morning. God, we come before you with heavy hearts, praying for hope, for peace for the Nixon family. We pray that you receive Richard into your open arms of love. We pray that you come down and be right beside Pauletta, giving her giving her that peace that surpasses all understanding your spirit, Lord. Give her strength to grieve, grace, grace to feel the love um, uh, that surrounds her and her friends and her family. We pray that you pour that upon her. We also pray for Mike and Nancy Burns, um, who are friends with Pauletta and Richard, that you would be with them as well during, during this difficult time of having, lose, of having lost Richard. God, we also want to pray for healing for Chad Price, um, who has uh, been struggling this past week um, with COVID-19. Uh, we, we, we pray that you would just heal his body and um, bring him safely through this uh, disease, God. We want to continue to pray for Bob Henschel, my uncle, who is um, in the middle stages of, of dementia at the moment. We pray for him. We pray for uh, his family, especially his wife, Jean. Um, we pray for their children and grandchildren 
Um, and all of, everyone who knows the family is they're struggling to understand how to live in this new reality, God. We also want to uh, lift up Karen Clary again, who is going to start soon a, uh, a trial cancer treatment uh, for her cancer, God, after she unfortunately, uh, this chemo uh, therapy that she had earlier was not effective. We pray that this trial treatment will be extremely effective and will help heal her of this terrible disease, God. We want to continue as well to pray for Mike Habistak, especially uh, for his MRI tomorrow when he goes in to learn, hopefully, some fantastic news about how his own chemo has been successful in significantly reducing the size of his own cancer, God. We, we pray that you would be there in the midst um, of him and with his family as uh, they, they take these tests. And uh, we pray for great results, God. We also want to continue to pray for Mindy Burnett and Janice Myers. They too struggle with cancer and emphysema, God. And then as we've been praying, especially as we've seen this past week, we want to pray for our nation and for all those who are in Texas and other places within our nation that have been struggling, especially this past week, um, with um, loss of utilities, with, with heat and, and now water especially, God. We pray that um, as the lights come back on and things get fixed, that you continue to heal people's lives, that you look after them as they begin this, this long process of, in, in a lot of ways, rebuilding, God. And so we just pray that you would look after them there, all those people who have lost um, homes and, uh, and even loved ones, God, in the midst of this past week and this cold snap that we had. Um, we pray, Lord, that you would just be with us throughout this period of Lent, this time of Lent, like we prayed earlier, that you would deliver us from, from our sin, from our pride, from this, these fears that we have um, in the world, that we, would look, um, so, that we would look to you for all of our hope and our strength in this time, God, that we recognize our dependence upon you and thrive in that. And God, we look forward to this, this time over these next few weeks as we dig into your word, into your scriptures, and into our own lives, doing some real good examination of our own, our own hearts and minds and souls, God. We pray that you would be with us, that you would give us the eyes to see and the ears to hear what you would have to show us about ourselves and about your kingdom. And we ask these things in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, who is the most visible example of your will that we have, um, and who at one point in his life taught us all um, how to pray when he said, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Today we start our Lenten series on the seven deadly sins. And to begin, I'd like to talk about pride. I've been looking into the idea of pride as one of those fundamental sins over the past few weeks. And along the way, I ran across this book. It's a really old book by a monk named Bernard of Clairvaux. In this book, Bernard describes 12 degrees of pride, 12. You might think of them in some sense like Dante's nine levels of hell. They get worse as you go down. But some of them, some of these degrees of pride are really quite funny. Level number three, let me just tell you too, he says it's silly merriment exhibited in too frequent laughter. And I have to admit that this one kind of surprised me until I remembered that Bernard was originally talking to a bunch of fellow monks. Um, but still, he's got a good point. If you laugh all the time, then you're probably ignoring the suffering that's going on around you. And you might even be ignoring your own sin. So I guess he's saying don't be a comedian or something like that. The list goes on, though, for him. And there are some levels that look, well, let's just say a lot more familiar than that one. Like level number four, conceit. Or level number six, self-assertion, which Bernard describes as thinking of oneself as more pious than others. Then there's defense of your own wrongdoing, which makes perfect sense. Um, and then coming in at number nine is, 
is this one. Unreal confession when a severe penance or punishment is imposed. I, I found it interesting that that one's so high, all right? Number nine, unreal confession, so faking it. Anyway, the top two are rather, we might say, the bottom two, the most hellish levels of pride, according to Bernard, are these. Number 11, a full liberty to sin. And number 12, habitual transgression. That is, sinning over and over again without remorse or even, it seems, a care in the world. But what about number one? What about number one? When I, when I first started this research on pride, I was most interested in Bernard's first level of pride, the thing that opens it all up, that starts pride, the root of pride itself, we might say. Because, and I was interested in this because let me tell you, what, what Bernard says that this root of pride is, it doesn't seem that bad. Not bad at all. You see, for Bernard, the first step we all take when we fall into the sin of pride is we're curious. It's curiosity. Now, you have to be honest with me. How many of you guessed that? Curiosity. But just listen to the example that Bernard gives. There was once a monk, he says, who gave every indication for years that he was a really good monk. But one day, something changed. The monk's eyes, they began to wander, not, not in a lustful way, but in a way that you could tell that he wanted to know everything that was going on everywhere around him. He just, he had to know what everyone else was doing, what they were thinking. And so Mr. Curiosity Monk began to spend more and more time looking at others and less and less time focusing on his, his own life and his own thoughts and his own betterment. In the end, this monk stopped watching over his own life altogether, and he turned all of his attention to everything else and everyone else around him. He lost, Bernard says, the habit of self-examination, and that loss manifested itself in a prideful curiosity that was focused solely on the things around him. Before this week, I don't think I'd ever have put curiosity that high on my list of sins or on the inner workings of pride, but I've got to say that Bernard, I think, has a point. Our main passage that we're going to be looking at today is Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 through 7, and I think curiosity shows up here in two ways that we might never have noticed before. So if you've got your Bibles, go ahead and turn with me to Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. This is the story of humanity's great fall into sin when Adam and Eve, they decide to eat the forbidden fruit. For a long time, this story has been considered the big story about sin and pride's role in sin. So let's see right now if we can't discover how curiosity has ended up killing the human race here in the first chapters of the Bible. Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other wild animal that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God say, You shall not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden. But God said, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the middle of the garden, nor shall you touch it, or you shall die. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of it and ate. And she also gave some to her husband and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened and they knew that they were naked. Now, where do you suppose curiosity is in this story? I think if we look closely, we can see it right there at the end, when Eve finally lets her eyes wander over to that tree. You see, her curiosity is piqued by the serpent, and it gets the best of her. This serpent gets the best of her. Listen again to verse 6. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. You see, Eve, come to find out, was curious. It does look good, she says. I, I wonder what it tastes like. And wouldn't it be nice to be wise? 
Bernard, in, his, in this book, The Twelve Degrees of Pride, reminds us of something that's quite obvious, I think, if we just sat down and thought about it for a second. It is impossible, he says, to sin. It's impossible to sin if the opportunity to do so never comes up. How can we sin if we're never given the opportunity to sin in the first place? But here's where curiosity comes in. What does curiosity do? It looks for opportunity. It looks for opportunity, not necessarily because it wants to sin, at least not in the beginning, but because curiosity opens up the door to do so nonetheless. I call this the problematic character of prideful curiosity, the problematic character. It's why we put locks on our cabinet doors where we store all the chemicals because we don't want our kids to even be tempted to touch them. We don't want their curiosity to become a problem. For us adults, though, things get a bit more complicated. Sarah told me just this week that she deleted Facebook. We all know social media can drive us nuts. It's, it's just really hard not to get mad at something that we read or see on there. The stuff becomes a trigger for us. We see, we read something on Facebook, Twitter, um, any of these uh, platforms, and we start spouting off. We get onto our high horses, into our echo chambers, and we write things we probably never say out loud. We spy, we troll, we wonder why we're angry or feeling beaten down all the time, and that's why. If you're anything like me, every morning I do this. I wake up and the first thing I do is I look over at my phone. I don't even get out of bed. I just lean over and pick up my phone and begin flipping through my newsfeed. I did it this morning. Is it really that hard to guess why I'm doing that? It's because I'm being curious. I'm curious what's going on around me. My ears, they start to perk up. My eyes, they start to roam. This is when curiosity becomes a problem. What inevitably happens is it opens the door to something more sinister. Maybe it's anger, maybe it's rage, maybe it's jealousy or lust or envy or just simple mean-spiritedness. Maybe it's more and more curiosity. I found myself, literally found myself, scrolling back weeks in my newsfeed. Weeks! And for what? I don't know. Something to get me going, I guess. But why? It wasn't for my own betterment, I can tell you that. You see, Eve's first mistake, I take it, in Genesis 3, just like her husband's Adam's a few verses later, her first mistake is to give in to her curiosity. She sees that the tree is good for food, that it's a delight to the eyes, that it's to be desired to make one wise. If she had it, if Eve had it been curious about that tree in the first place, she wouldn't have had the opportunity to eat from it. It wouldn't even have shown up on her radar. Now we might say, but, but Eve was tempted, and that's true. But what did the serpent use to tempt her? He used her curiosity. The serpent poked exactly where it needed to. You see, for some of us, maybe for all of us here on this first Sunday in Lent, we're being called to do what Sarah did. We're being called to delete Facebook or, or our social media accounts. Maybe you need to turn off the news even every once in a while. If what you're reading and hearing is driving you mad, physically angry even, then the easiest way to solve your problem is to close the door to your curiosity. Delete the app. Leave your phone with your keys when you get home. Definitely don't do what I do and put it next to your bed. You might even think, who knows, about moving the TV downstairs. Any of these options is better than the alternative. Because whatever the case, our prideful curiosity causes problems. It is problematic. But it's more than just problematic. You see, our curiosity does more than simply open up the door for, some, for something worse. Prideful curiosity is itself a symptom of something worse than it. If curiosity is problematic, it is only so because it is symptomatic. And what curiosity is symptomatic of is our lack of self-examination, our lack of self-examination. That curious monk that Bernard uses as his example makes a lot of sense when we stop to think about pride's own starting place. Pride begins when we think we've made it. It begins when we stop evaluating or stop examining our own thoughts and our own beliefs and our own assumptions. And instead we start 
we start thinking that we have nothing else to learn, that there's nowhere else to grow, or worse, that we've got God's own handle on things. These are lies, of course, but Bernard just calls it a failure of self-examination. We stop examining ourselves, and we start, really, judging. Look back with me at Genesis 3. If Eve is curious about that tree, she's also curious about why God put it there and why he told her not to eat of it. Did God say, you shall not eat of the garden, of the tree in the garden, the serpent asks? And Eve answers, what did she say? She says, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the middle of the garden, nor shall you touch it, nor, or you will die. But the serpent then says to the woman, right, and says to Eve, and um, the suspicion that he raises about God's intentions, the serpent says to the woman, you will not die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, all right? And you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So thanks to the serpent, Eve is now suspicious about God's intentions, about God's motives uh, for putting that tree in the garden. Suspicion is a form of curiosity that's gone prideful. It believes it knows better. Eve, who buys the serpent's argument, hook, line, and sinker, she assumes she can see right through God's words and actions, right down into his heart. She believes she knows God's real intent, and it's not good. She, God's intent is not good, she thinks. She sees him as being jealous, as dominating, um, it, as him withholding good things. The sin Eve comes to realize for herself, right, is so clear now to her. It isn't her reaching out for that tree. The real sin is God withholding things from her. So she thinks, who's really in the wrong here? It's not me, it's God. This is how dangerously far prideful curiosity and suspicion can take us when we're certain we know what's going on, when we stop short of self-examination. I was reminded of a book this week about Jose de Acosta. Uh, This might help some of us out here as as we look into this. De Acosta was a Spanish explorer and missionary who traveled throughout Latin America in really the first century after Columbus. He discovered a whole host of different peoples and traditions, and they all thought differently about life and about God than Acosta did. And he wanted to know why. And his answer, always his answer, was this. It's the devil, he said. In the words of Willie Jennings, um, who talks about Acosta, Acosta was confident that he could see through the natives that he met in America, through the indigenous people. He could see through them. Acosta assumed, just like Eve did, that he could see into their hearts, down into their real intentions, and that he alone could know what was actually going on inside. Acosta was confident that he knew more about these people's customs and beliefs than even they did themselves. You might ask, what gave Acosta such confidence? The same question is, what gave Eve such confidence that she could see into the mind of God? And the answer, of course, fundamentally, is pride. But it's a pride that's given free reign because these people failed to examine themselves and were only curious about others. In Matthew 7, Jesus is nearing the end of his Sermon on the Mount when he starts talking like this, he says, do not judge so that you may not be judged. For with the judgment you make, you will be judged and the measure you give will be the measure you get. Why do you see the speck in your neighbor's eye but do not notice the log in your own eye? Or how can you say to your neighbor, let me take the speck out of your eye while the log is in your own? You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your neighbors. Nobody thinks Jesus is saying here that we should never call out sin or evil when we see it. That's why he adds at the end that once we've taken the log out of our own eye, then we'll see clearly enough to take the speck out of someone else's. Sin is a sin is a sin, and it deserves to be called out for the good of the individual and the community and the whole entire world. But pride, pride takes over when we start to wonder, when we get curious about what others need to learn and where they might need to grow. Pride starts when we stop asking ourselves questions or letting others ask questions of us. 
It starts when we stop examining our own thoughts and our own hearts. I mean, just, just listen to how Bernard puts it in those 12 degrees of pride in that book. He says, by dwelling on the shortcomings of your neighbor without sufficient attention to your own shortcomings, you may be moved not to pity, but to anger, not to assist the other, but to condemn them, he says, and so to destroy in a spirit of wrath rather than to restore in a spirit of meekness or humility. Pride takes over, Bernard says, when we stop examining our own lives and start to see wrong only in others. Haven't we seen exactly this happen a lot lately? Haven't we been guilty of it too? The friend of mine who reminded me this week of Acosta's prideful ability to see through all the indigenous people that he met said that maybe the application here for us is this. He said, maybe we should stop trying to look through everyone else and start looking at our own insides. After all, he said, isn't that the heart of Christianity? Aren't we supposedly a people of repentance? Doesn't Jesus call us to humility first and foremost? And shouldn't that translate to how we view and respect others? You're going to hear a lot about what Lent is about, but this is its most fundamental purpose. Lent is here to remind us that God is God and we are not. So let's put ourselves under the microscope. Lent is here to remind us always to examine our hearts and our minds and our own assumptions and to let God work his scalpel on us. King David says in Psalm 51, wash me thoroughly, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin, O God, for I know my transgressions and my sins are always before me. They are always before us. Today, this week, this season, we commit to being a people who wake up in the morning and say this and then live our lives like we believe it. For me, I'm going to be part of a hard conversation. I'm going to take a part of a hard conversation about white privilege. I've told you before that I feared for a long time that there are many ways that I, I'm probably racist and not even conscious of them. I've seen so much white privilege and racism manifest itself in far too many people that are close to me to assume that I've somehow escaped it all. But admitting this is only the first step of self-examination. Next, I've got to put myself in a place where the grace of God can start to heal me. I've got to let God work on that plank in my own eye. So I'm joining an online discussion this week of the book, Me and White Supremacy. If that's something that you believe God is calling you to examine in your life too, then give me a call this week and we'll walk this road together. Of course, there are many, many areas of our lives that require self-examination. That's, that's part of being on the walk with God. I think today, I think today we can see just how arrogant Jose de Acosta was, but I don't think he could. History is full of such blindness to our own sins, and the root of that blindness is pride. Today, don't let it be that way for you. Ask, where do I need self-examination? Let someone else ask, where do you think I need self-examination? Because only in this way can we begin to embrace, like we've been saying, the good, and the full life of God. Let's pray. O Lord and Master of our lives, we pray today with Christians from so many ages past. We pray that you would take from us the spirit of sloth, of despair, of lust for power, of idle conversation. We pray that you would give us instead the spirit of self-restraint, humility, patience, and of course, love. For we are your servants. Yes, for you are our Lord and our King, so we ask that you enable us to see our own sins and to help us not to judge others. For you are holy and blessed forever and ever. Amen.
Thank you for joining us on this first Sunday in Lent, and a special thanks to my friend Brandon O'Brien for reminding me about Jose de Costa. Before we go, though, let me quickly share with you a card, a card we received in the mail this week. It's from Mike and Hillary Sturgill. I'll just read it to you. We would like to thank everyone who wished us well and sent gifts to celebrate the birth of our new baby boy. We can't tell you how much it means to be part of such a loving and supportive church family. Thank you all from Mike, Hillary, and baby Jackson. All of you are great. Thanks for giving um, to Mike and Hillary and baby Jackson. If you haven't seen a picture of Jackson, he is an absolute cutie. Next week, my friends, we're going to be talking about two more of the seven deadly sins, greed and envy. So I hope you can join us for this next part of our discussion of From the Ashes, Embracing the Full Life of God. Until then, let me just leave you with this. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with all of you. I'll see you next week.